Hey everybody, I wanted to come here and make a video about how to use a chainsaw. By the end of this video, you are not gonna be a total tree cutting wizard, but you are going to have the basic knowledge about you know, what it takes to own and operate a chainsaw without cutting your head off. We're starting with this saw right here. This isn't the kind of saw I'd normally run um, for you know applications of working on the ground. Usually I personally would run a larger saw, 70 cc's and up. This is a Husqvarna 355 Rancher. I kind of want this video to be an introduction to running a chainsaw. You know, if you're a guy that you just bought your first saw and you're kind of wondering how to own it, how to operate it, hopefully you'll find this video helpful. So I wanted to get basically what I would call a homeowner saw. Typically in my videos, you'll see me running larger saws when I'm working on the ground, usually 70 cc's and up. This is a 55 cc saw. This, this is a great saw. They're really, they've been around for a long time. It'll get the job done. I wanted it to be sort of realistic for that uh, average homeowner. So I'm not using my big ported saws. We're gonna go out, we're gonna cut down a tree with this 455 Rancher. They actually sell this on Amazon for $530, I believe, with a 20 inch bar and chain, which is what I will be putting on this in a little bit. So we're gonna go through the parts of it, you know what the terminology means. We're gonna cut down a tree and cut it up. We're gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of go through everything so that you feel like you're equipped at the end of this video. You you understand your saw. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. I, I will be, I'm gonna be given the saw. I have this online store called Sappy Supplies and for the next year, I every month I'm doing a chainsaw giveaway. So you can go to sappysupplies.com uh, for a chance to win this saw or if you're watching this in a few months, it'll be a different chainsaw. But I'm doing chainsaw giveaways. If you like the saw, you can also just buy it on Amazon. I'll put a link to this saw in the description. So. We've got the saw, and now the next thing we need to do is get this thing gas and oiled. All right, so what kind of gas should you use for your saw? You know, all of the really smart saw guys that I talk to, they really preach about ethanol-free gas. So this is a gas station by my house. Uh, I just Googled ethanol-free gas stations in Washington State. And this one is just down the road for me. So this is where I get my gas. These ethanol free. I don't know if the octane really matters that much. Some people say it does, some say it doesn't. But I think the biggest thing is that the ethanol is, it's uh, the way I understand it, it's like a, it's made from corn or something like that. They put it in the gas, to make it stretch farther. But the problem is, especially if the sauce sits for a long time, that fuel can separate the gas from the ethanol. And it kind of degrades all the, you know, all the rubber hoses and the plastic and everything. So it's just best to use ethanol free gas is, is what I'm told and I do it. My saws run really well for a really long time. So I, I like these, I like these pre-measured mixers. I see some people that are over there like a chemist trying to like, you know, guess the ratio and stuff. I run 50 to one, I do full synthetic. This is still, I, I also will run like VP. I think Husqvarna makes one too. They come in regular or synthetic. I just use synthetic because they say it's better. I don't really know the difference it makes, but I definitely like not having to measure the stuff myself because I just think it works better that way. I've done a lot of traveling this. I, I don't I don't know when I opened this or why I did, but for some reason I, I opened this. I think I used it to, uh, for my foam air. I don't, I don't know why, what I opened this for, but basically I gotta get gas here and then I'll go, I'll got, go home and put another mixer in it. Oh, what the heck? It usually goes smoother than this. <laughs> okay, I had to go home because I <laughs> I'd already used some of that mixer. So this is the same stuff. I mean, this is VP. This is actually what I've been using. Um, this is what I use. I got like a big case of it. I actually think this has been discontinued because I can't find the five gallon mixers anymore. So this is actually what I usually run, but um, you know, they sell different synthetic mixers. I was going to do two and a half gallons because I just, I just mixed some gas, but I'll just do five gallons again. So usually I pour it in before I fill it up with gas because then the, I feel like the pump kind of mixes it. But this is just so, you know, for, for a guy like me, this is perfect because it's super like idiot proof, you know, I don't have to measure nothing. I know that it says mix with five gallons. So I just put it in there and then all you got to do is shake it up, which it's usually good to do that at the gas station because then it kind of gets shaken up when you're driving. But now I got to manually do it. Life's hard. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. All right, so these, these Husky caps, they have a slot right there. You can stick a bar wrench in there if you want to help open it. I really recommend you try to do that just as a last resort because you will tear that out and gum it up. I, I try to just do these by hand. I don't really like to stick a bar wrench in there. So we're just gonna fill this baby up. And I always try to fill up on gravel or dirt or something. Don't, you know, don't do it on somebody's nice, on their driveway or something, you know, or like right above their plants try to do it on dirt or gravel or something so okay gas is done bar oil so it's very important first of all what kind of bar oil this is just from still I, I really don't think it matters that much what kind of bar oil you use I know people have opinions on it but all, all this does is it lubricates the chain a lot of people think that you put the oil in and it helps the engine run but the way that a two cycle engine works is the oil is actually mixed into the fuel so we already put the oil in when we when we uh, put this bad boy into the gas. So this is actually the, the oil that the engine uses. The, the bar oil is just to lubricate the chain. That's all, it, that's all it does. So just get whatever bar oil you can get your hands on. Depending on the time of year, if it's really cold, sometimes the bar oil will be very thick and it won't wanna work that good. If that's the case, I'll just squirt a little bit of gas in there and mix it up and that will thin, uh, that'll thin out the bar oil. Um, I don't know if that's dangerous or not. <laughs> that's so flammable, but I, I haven't had any problems with it. So this is just regular, I don't know, steel bar oil. And it's important, you get about two tanks of bar oil for every one tank of gas that you run. But it's just important, just a good rule of thumb. If it needs gas, it needs bar oil, just top it off. Um, you're just gonna, you, if, if you run out of bar oil, you're gonna really overheat your guide bar and your chain. You're gonna have all kinds of problems. Just do gas and oil, always together, always at the same time. I will probably spill a bunch of this, because I always do. But <laughs> I try so hard not to. Oh, yeah. That was 100% effort right there. <laughs> it spilled very little. So my advice, use a pre-measured deal, use ethanol-free gas. Any bar oil will really do the trick. Always fill both up at the same time. And uh, don't try to don't try to be a chemist and just eyeball it. I, I've traveled and worked with a lot of different tree companies, and uh, I'll just tell you right now, the saws. A lot of places I've worked, they just they don't run very well because the gas just isn't mixed very well. So now it's full. Now we need to put the bar and chain on. Okay, so we are going to mount this. This is a twenty inch guide bar that we're going to mount to the saw. But before I do that, I want to just talk about some of these numbers real quick so you can know what you're looking at with these, because there's actually some good information that you might want to know on the bar. First get a saw, you know, and especially if, if you got a saw and you don't know what size chain or bar or what you got, there's usually a marking on the bar right here that you can look at. So this is going to tell you what you need to know. So it's a Husqvarna mount. Husky and still don't take the same mount. You know that it's 20 inches long. It's 3 eighths. That's the um, and it's, so it's three eighths and it's 72 drive links right there. And, you know, that's basically the, the size of the cutters and how many drive links. Each one of these is a drive links. And this is a three eighths cutting tooth right here. It's a 50 gauge guide bar. So that's just a measurement of the thickness of the chain and the bar. And I think I already said 72 drive links. So good information on the bar right there. If you're having issues mounting your bar or chain, Make sure you try to look at this area on the, the lower side of the guide bar right there to make sure that they ac actually match up. All right, so how do we put this bar and chain on? It's not, you know, it, it's not rocket science, but there is a little bit to it. So first thing we gotta do is we gotta take the cover off right here. So usually Husky will have smaller nuts and still will have Bigger nuts. This is my friend Gordy's three-point dogs he makes. You can buy those at westcoastsaw.com. So, okay, we're gonna take the cover off. And here we've got, I, I believe it's called an outboard clutch. That's where the clutch protrudes out of the body of the saw like that. Uh, for compare, they're not all like that. So for comparison, here's my 462. See, I just popped these off. They're a little bit bigger than nuts. So this, the clutch style is different. So the clutch is actually inside the body of the saw. So you can see the sprocket a little more easily. So it's gonna be important that you get the chain, the drive links of the chain inside the sprocket. So we've got our saw here. Now we're gonna mount it. We're gonna put the, we're gonna put the chain on first. 
and you can kind of feel when you do this how it's it's actually in the sprocket. It's not roll. Sometimes you you think the chain's on, but it's on a different part. But it's actually in the. And a good tip is every other time you install the bar, flip it. It'll wear more evenly that way. So we're gonna put this on. We're gonna get the chain inside the bar. Okay, so now the, the chain is in the guide bar. We need to tighten up the chain. So we need to talk about the tensioner right here. What the tensioner does is it pushes the bar into the chain and that's how you get the tension of your chain. And some saws, it's on the cover itself. Some saws like my 462 here, if you see right there, the tensioner is actually on the body of the saw and the clutch cover just has a hole through it so you can get to it. But either way, you gotta find the, the tensioner and we're gonna put this on here. I can feel that uh, the tensioner is not lined up with that hole in my guide bar yet. I'm just gonna put these, the, the bar nuts on. They're just kind of loose. They're just to hold the cover on. If you tighten the, the bar nuts down all the way, then the bar won't be able to slide as you adjust your chainsaw chain. So I'm just gonna back this up until I feel it kind of click in there. Okay, see, I can feel that I've got it now. So now I'll just make these just snug enough so that it's holding the bar in place, but the bar can still slide underneath the cover. And now you'll see as I tighten this, the slack will come out of the chain. There you go. They say when you lightly lift up, you wanna see the bottom of three drive links. It's kind of a, a rough estimate. So, okay, so it's, so it's on there. Now we've got a pretty good amount of tension on there. And if you want, you can actually, you can do this a few ways. You can lift it up, you can turn it upside down, or you can also just hold the saw like that. And it pushes the guide bar up a little bit, which will help prevent you cutting. You know, the, the further up this sits, the harder it is to cut the dirt on the other side. So sometimes I'll, I'll just do a little bit, just something like that and just tighten the bar nuts down. And don't do that until you get the proper tension because like I said, that the bar, the, the bar cannot slide if you tighten these down before you mess with the tension. And now I'll know that this is on correctly if I can actually slide the chain. Yeah, see, grabbing the back of the tooth with my bar wrench. I know I'm in the sprocket. If I was not in the sprocket, especially ha happens with these style chainsaws, Sometimes you think you're in the sprocket, but you've actually got the chain resting right here and you can't figure out why the chain won't spin. It's because it's not actually in the sprocket. And then don't be surprised when you run this, if it loosens up a little bit, the chain will probably stretch a little bit. You can just stop, loosen up the bar nuts, tension it with the saw off, of course, and uh, you know, get that slack out. And now that we've got our bar and chain installed, now let's talk a little bit about the individual parts of the chainsaw. So we'll talk about some of the safety parts about the chainsaw. So the first thing to know about is this thing right here. This is called your chain break. And this is super important. This, what this does is as the chain is spinning in the saw, there's a spring that kind of floats over the clutch. And when you engage that, it clamps down on the clutch. It's not meant to be used to slow down the chain and you don't want to, you know, wah and just slam on it. You, if you can, you want to let the, saw stop on its own and then engage the chain brake. So if you have to take a step or something, you know, put it on, it's very easy to engage. And also if the saw kicks back, which we'll talk about a little bit later, it's very easy to engage the chain brake. So having a functional chain brake, really important as far as safety goes. All right, now the felling dogs. You hear people talk about dogs. This is what they're talking about. These are aftermarket. I actually bought this saw from Gordy. He used this saw to design these uh these three-point dogs for this model of chainsaw so th these are aftermarket this didn't come on the saw but the ones that came on the saw look similar except there's a fourth and these these are kind of aggressive they're nice for the pacific northwest because the, we have very thick barked trees so but what these dogs do is they allow you to grab with leverage you know to to cut to, to cut more efficiently it makes your life way easier because they call it dog and then you can stick them into wood and then you can pivot the saw on the dogs rather than trying to just muscle everything. So if the saw is operating correctly, if your chain's sharp, and if you use your dogs, the chain saw should do all the work itself. It's an auto feeding tool. You know, you don't need to 
really, you know, you shouldn't be straining or anything. And so relying on these dogs, you, you know, you'll see it becomes very important if you want to not burn yourself out on them. You do got to be careful. You don't stab yourself in the leg when you start this thing. Next thing we'll talk about is the felling sites. The felling sites are usually going to be a line right here on this side of the saw. Some saws will have a full wrap handle. Most of my saws do. It's very common for the larger saws, especially on the West Coast, to have another handle here. Um, but this one doesn't. This is a half wrap handle. And this line right here actually indicates where the tree is going to fall, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And there'll be another one on this side right here, this line right here. These are your felling sites. And these, they're your best friends. They're incredibly reliable. And those are important when you go to, you know, fall a tree. Even even up here, there's a line right here. So even when you're doing your, if you're doing an angled cut, you can use that as well. But where that line faces, that's where the tree's gonna fall most of the time. All right, so starting the chainsaw. This saw's actually got instructions on it. But ba basically, most saws they are going to have, you know, they'll have a primer bubble and they'll have an off and on switch and then they'll have a choke right here. And so if it does have a bubble, or, and a lot of them have a decomp button right here. So this makes it easier to start if you push that in. First thing, if you've got the primer bubble, push that, I don't know, 10, 20 times, I guess till it fills up with fuel. Okay, make sure that you are, I've actually never ran one of these saws before, but make sure you're not on, <laughs> you're not on stop. And you're gonna pull out the choke and you're going to start it. You're going to hear it burp, it's called. It'll almost start and then you're gonna push it in and then it, it should start. Okay, so when it comes to starting it, there are kind of three general ways that people do it. You can either start it on the ground like this with your foot through the handle. And the advantage to that is you're kind of far away from the, the chainsaw chain. If the saw is really heavy, this will probably be the, the easiest way to do it. This is probably the easiest and safest way to do it with your foot in the handle like this. Another way that people start them often is they'll put it right put it right in their crotch like this and they'll start it like that and uh the idea is that this is a little safer than the way i'm about to show you which is how i do it so you can also crotch start it but the way i start the chainsaw and this is not i don't recommend that you start the saw this way but the way i do it is something called drop starting where you actually use the weight of the saw and you push down as you pull up the advantage to drop starting the saw is you use the weight of the saw you use that inertia to help you turn the engine over. Usually when you see professionals, you know, in the real world, you know, production tree guys, timber fallers, they almost always drop start the saw just because it's so much easier on the body to do it that way. You just got not very good leverage starting it like this or bent over like this. That changes with long bars. With, lo with long bar, you probably want it on the ground. But with these short bars, the easiest way is to drop start them, but it's very dangerous for a couple reasons. Number one, when you start it, you can jam the dogs into your leg or the chainsaw chain into your leg, especially if the brake's off, because when this thing fires up, the chain's just gonna go spinning. So drop starting it is the easiest, I would say. Starting it like this is probably the safest. And uh, this, is the, <laughs> this is the goofiest way. I, I just don't know why people start it this way. I think it's so weird, it's so uncomfortable. I'm reaching across the shoulder, but you know, if you look up a video about how to start a chainsaw or you look in the user manuals, this is usually the recommended way. I just personally think it's kind of silly. I'll start the safe way for the video though. So chain break on, really important. I'm gonna stick my foot through the handle. I've, I've primed it, the choke is on. So I'm gonna pull the saw, I should hear it burp. And now in theory that it's burped, I push the, the choke back in and this thing should just fire up. And, and I don't know what the deal, sometimes it's like a, when it starts, it'll usually be at a high idle like that. You just give it one brop on the throttle with the chain brake on and it should idle quite nicely. I mean, it's just, I, I know this isn't how they recommend it. It's just so much easier. But that's the gist of starting it. Make sure your fuel's right, choke it, make go until it burps, turn the choke off, and then it should fire up. If you hear it idling high, squeeze the throttle, and it should just run good like this.
so now the next thing I'll talk about is warming up and breaking in the chainsaw. There are a million different theories. Everybody I've ever worked with has a different opinion on how you should break in a chainsaw. Some say start it, fire it up, just go balls to the wall. Some say let it run a whole tank of gas through it. I've tried every way imaginable and I've really not noticed any difference. For the most part, when it comes to running these saws, I think it's just best to just start the saw, let it idle for a minute. That, you know, I'm not super engine savvy, but the way Gordy's explained it to me, you know, there, there are different metals in the piston, cylinder, all, all that parts, and by heating them up really fast, they don't heat up at the same rate, and it's just good to let the engine warm up so everything consistently reaches a high temperature together, if that makes sense. It probably doesn't make any sense, but just let the saw warm up. You don't need to start it and wah, go straight to it. If you have to do that, there's, there might be something wrong with your saw or your carburetor. So, and I, I really don't do any break-in method. I just let it idle for about a minute, like I normally would, and then I just go about uh, working. And I've had a lot of saws, and I've, I've tried breaking them in every way imaginable. So this, you know, and once again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop start it again, just because that is the way that I do it, especially with these short bars, but it's not, <laughs> I'll do it the textbook way, here. I guess it's not so bad. So the saw is it's, it's warm, it's, it's broken in for the most part, I think. So we just talked about starting the saw and I kind of showed you an ideal situation. It fired right up. But sometimes you'll see, you know, you, you, you might be in that situation where you're just pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling and it's just not happening. And what happens a lot of the times is if you you remember that initial burp that I, I first got? If I would have kept pulling the saw, I'll do it right now, I'll just flood it for you. So choke on, chain break on. Okay, so it burped, everything's going good, but what happens if I uh, didn't hear that or something and I, I just keep pulling? Okay, so I've been pulling and it's just not starting. What happens is so much gas is going through at a certain point where you actually flood the saw. Um, I, don't, I don't really know what that means, but I know how to fix it. And there are really only two ways if your saw is flooded. One is just put the saw down and come back in like a half hour or something to let the gas that's in there dry out and then sort of start again. But if you, if you flood the saw and you need to get it going, the only other way that I know how to start it is, and this is not, textbook or anything but if you need to start the saw and it's flooded you have to hold the trigger down I don't know why it works but it works and if you hold the trigger down when you start the saw it will fire up when it's flooded it might not be that easy but very important that the chain brake is on because as soon as this saw fires up the chains gonna be spinning um, like like crazy because you're you're full throttle you're going straight to full throttle so chain brake is on try to find yourself a nice piece of wood um, and you're just going to hold the, once again, guys, this is not like textbook. I'm not telling you this is how you start it, but if you're in that predicament, you just can't get your saw started. It might be that it's flooded. So you just hold the trigger down. And that'll do the trick. You saw that smoke coming out. That's a sign that, that, it, that it was flooded. I mean, that's the gist of, of starting the saw. and I feel pretty good. I'm gonna chop down a tree, but before I do that, I want to talk about chainsaw chaps. Chaps are amazing at what they do. They're designed to stop the chainsaw from spinning, and it's absolutely incredible how well they work. I've gotten myself once in the chaps before, um, and I'm glad that I was wearing them. It was actually pretty recently, too. Look, that's the first time I've done that. Yeah, look at that, you know, I didn't feel a thing. I just felt my pants tug and I looked down and I cut my pants. So, well, that's how chainsaw chaps work. So I'm going to cut a pair of chaps and show you what they're made of. These, these, this was my first pair of chainsaw trousers I ever owned. This is, 
I don't know. Um, I mean, this is going back probably eight years or something. These are Fanner Gladiator pants. And you can actually see the chainsaw chap material in here. I've cut these once for a video already in the past, but I'm gonna do it again. You'll see this material is designed to, it clogs up the sprocket of the saw. Here, I'll show you. I, I, I really didn't, um, <laughs> I really didn't care for these pants that much. They're so hot and the material is like really bulky on the inside. So what I wear, I wear these, these are uh, Defender Pros from Cloggers. And uh, they even got my name on them. And I think Cloggers makes the best chainsaw pants. I sell them on my site, sappysupplies.com. I also sell some Oregon uh, like strap-on chaps that are a lot cheaper than the Cloggers. I, I wear the Zeros when it's hot outside. We're in the fall now. I wear the Defender Pros in the winter. When it's really cold, I'll wear the, the Embers that are called. Cloggers makes fantastic products. Let me show you how these work. <laughs> I mean, they look at it is all jammed. Look at that. All right, so let's take a look, see what we got going on here. This is a really nice bar inch. I sell this on my site, sappysupplies.com. It's nice because it's husky on one side, still on the other side, and it's short enough to fit under the the four wrap handle bars that I like to use. So, which the saw doesn't have. So let's just take this clutch cover off here. Take the chain break off to get this clutch cover off. So look at that. It's just barely, look, it's just, it's either Kevlar or Dyneema. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's just, it, it really blows my mind how well it works. It just clogs up the sprocket right there. So the sprocket can't turn. It's not like this stuff is so tough. The chain can't cut through. It, this won't even dull the chain. It just, it just clogs up the sprocket. And, uh, and look at that. I just took a little bit out and now look at, we're all good to go. I can just get back about my business. So it's just truly, you know, I've done this a bunch of times and every time I'm just amazed at how, how great they work. I mean, look, I had them wrapped around this log right here that there's no, it didn't even cut through. It didn't even hit these vines or anything. It just doesn't stand a, a chance that the, the, the chaps work so incredibly well. Square ground, round ground, big saw, little saw. It, a good pair of chaps will stop it all. So just like that, the chaps, if that would have been my leg, it stops it dead in its tracks. Take that little bit of fluff out of the sprocket. No damage to the saw, no damage to the chain. You're good to go. I just, I really recommend wearing these pants. I mean, they've gotten so good over the last few years. They're expensive, but even just the ones that you buckle on, I just, I recommend the chaps highly. Okay, so felling a tree. This is not a comprehensive tree felling tutorial. I did a video on my old channel. Uh, I did a much more in-depth tree felling tutorial. You, you know, you, you could spend your whole life trying to perfect the craft of tree felling. There are so many variables, so many situations you can be in. So this is not a, a comprehensive tree felling tutorial. I'm just gonna give you the total basic meat and potatoes of dropping a tree. Right here, I've got a Douglas fir that has just started to die. And I'm actually at my neighbor's house and we're just gonna fall it. It's kind of kind of the easy tree. It does, it does lean back a little bit towards the power lines, I guess, but you know, I'm gonna use some wedges. I'm gonna fall it. And this will just be a real brief guide on, you know, the fundamentals of felling a tree. So the first step is I need to do a notch or a face cut, some people call it. It's, a, it's the first cut, it's a directional cut. And this will dictate where the tree lays down, you know, you can do a, a conventional cut, a humble, an open face. At the end of the day, what really is most important is you just gotta get a chunk of the tree out, <laughs> out of the front of it, because that's going to allow the tree to close. If you don't do a cut on the front, too much tension builds up when you're trying to do the back cut and the tree just explodes, it barber chairs. The tension, the compression will split apart. So you gotta get a chunk of tree out of the middle. So I'm gonna cut in, I'm gonna be looking at my felling sites right here. Some people do this cut first, I do this cut, it's just like a cultural regional thing. I do this cut first and uh, nothing to it.
I'm looking down my sights here. I've got, you know, I've got a sight on the back and a sight on the front, and I'm lining those up just like an actual gun sight. You line up the back and the front, and that's going to give the direction, which is right at Lucas. <laughs> right at Lucas. <laughs> uh, but th this is where we're going to be shooting it, so that that's the felling sights. Now, when you do your top cut and you want to line it up, there's actually a little. You, if you get down, you can actually see inside the curve here, and this will help you line up. So you you shoot for that corner. Just look down and take a peek in here. It'll help you line it up. I, I usually cut Humboldt's. I'm going to cut conventional because it's a little easier to cut, I think, for most people. So right, right here, I've got just a tiny bit of a, that's called a Dutchman right there. And that will actually close first and cause all kinds of problems. I, I just, I want to clean that Dutchman up. I got a little extra wood right here too. So just a little bit of cleanup and we're almost done with our face cut. Okay, so we've got our notch right here. The, the more open, the better, almost always. Just because if the tree, if you go really shallow and the tree starts to close, you just have to hope and pray you've got enough momentum going the right way. And this tree leans backwards. So by the time this tree stands up, this will already have closed pretty significantly. So I want it pretty open and that, that's, that's pretty open. Um, and like I said, you can do a Humboldt conventional. A lot of times when I've got a really small tree, I'll do a really, I mean, honestly, the steeper the better. It just opens it up all the more. This is a pretty standard regular notch for a regular tree. So now we're gonna, and I'm about a third of the way in, maybe a little bit less. I need room for my wedges. Sometimes you wanna go deeper than a third. Sometimes you wanna go more. A good rule of thumb though, is a third of the tree. That's what the textbooks say. And that's what I agree with for the most part, a third of the way in. Um, and then you just need, I, I will need to wedge this tree over. So face cut's done. Now let's do the back cut. And it's okay to double check your sights. I've got my saw right in the face cut here. Let's look at my sights again. We're lined up right there, which I'm shooting between these two cedars right here. The, the house is far enough away, hopefully. Um, so <laughs> the house is definitely far enough away, but just double checking my sights here. <laughs> Okay, so I'm in my back cut now. I'm level. You want your back cut to be pretty much level, maybe a little higher than your notch. I gotta be very careful because this tree leans backwards and I've gotta get a wedge. K&H wedges. <laughs> K&H wedges available at sappysupplies.com. This is a five and a half inch wedge. I'm gonna start with this because it's the smallest. I'm gonna be able to get it in pretty quickly. I'm gonna be a little bit stressed until I get this wedge in because of the power line's back there, but we're just gonna keep, keep at it. Another thing I'll do is I'll uh, try to focus on this side first. Anton taught me this. He said, focus on your far side first to get that one cut up and then go back because this is uh, sh sh uh, bigger than my bar. I want to kind of get this side cut up first because it's, you know, when I'm working over there, it's easy for me to see that side, but not this side. So I'm about there, 10%. I might need to go a little more. First, pretty tough, but that's about where we're at. I'm going to hopefully be able to stick my wedge in here pretty soon. <laughs> Saw axe handles available at Sappy Supplies.
I guess I can, I guess I can turn this off again. <laughs> so I got my wedge. I still got a lot of holding wood. This thing leans back. Now I'm just going to use the wedge to, I'm really just trying to hold the tree in place. I don't want to go so far that I hit my bar, you know, so I can still jiggle my bar. So that's good. So I'll cut a little more, tap a little more, cut a little more, tap a little more. You know, I can get behind the saw like this and I can still use my sights. So I'm still looking down the sight by just cutting straight. If you rock the saw back a bunch, you'll end up with some weird funky wood in the middle of the tree. But if you get your sights lined up and just go straight in, you'll know that you're true. Sorry, I keep shutting it off. You're probably like, get that tree over already, but it's just, these things are important. I, you'll notice I'll hit the wedge, you know, and I'll look up. There's a lot of dead wood up there and the vibrations from the wedge can really knock stuff loose. So I know you just want this tree to go over already, but there's, this is dangerous stuff. It, it really is. So there's a lot to it. And by pulling the bar out like this, I hate it. You, so when you're dogged in, remember the bar's at an angle like this. So you think that your bar is running this way, but when you pull it out, you'll see the bar is actually running that way. So pull it out a little bit. That'll help tell you where the holding wood is on the inside. I got a little more wood over here, but cut a little more over there. Okay, so I'm cut up. I don't have a lot of wood left. If I sever this holding wood, this tree just falls wherever gravity takes it. Not a lot of wood left there. Not a lot of wood left there. So I gotta wedge it over. It leaned back pretty hard. So it's gotta, if I keep cutting, it's gonna, it's gonna fail. Hopefully we got enough now. I should have a backup wedge in there for safety. <laughs> Another thing I forgot to talk about is when the tree goes over, you know, if the tree's going that way, the safest spot is at a 45 degree angle away from the tree. Don't turn your back on it. Look up because branches, all kinds of stuff can come flying back at you. So especially try to go a 45 degree angle, make sure you got a clean path, you know, keep your eyes up. Don't turn away from the tree because it can come back and get you. So you can see about a third of the way deep, stopped it. You want the hinge roughly 10% of the tree. I stopped, I didn't get greedy. I thought, you know what, I think it's enough. And it just wedged it over the rest of the way. And um, there's a lot more to it than that, but in another sense, there's really nothing more to it than that, <laughs> honestly. So, I mean, that's the basic gist of felling a tree. If you want more in depth, check out my old channel. Uh, I called it the world's best tree felling tutorial. So, okay, let's cut this thing up. So before we start cutting this thing up, I want to talk briefly about a little thing called tension and compression. <laughs> the, it, it's, it's a simple enough concept, but it is amazing how easy it is. I don't care who you are, it's so easy to get your bar pinched. You know, you go to cut the limbs off something and you know, you pinch your bar. It's all about tension and compression. If I could just share a story real quick. Years ago, I was, we were doing a safety meeting at Eastside and there were like 20 guys in the room and Scott asked, he was doing the safety meeting, he's like, who here still doesn't understand tension and compression? And it was kind of funny because uh, me and Jed were the only people that raised our hands and we had the most experience of <laughs> anybody in there. It's like, it almost seems like the, the, you, the longer you do it, the more you're like, what the heck? Uh, but, but, but this tree is super basic, you know, but basically, you know, tension and compression is, you know, when you're cutting stuff up, when, wherever, the tree is bending basically there's always a tension side and there's always a compression side if you look at my if you look at my uh my stick here you know as i pull this there's a lot of 
tension on the top of this. And if I were to cut this, this would just peel apart. But on the bottom side, you have compression. And if I try to cut it there, it would pinch because it, you know, it's trying to close. And that's really tension and compression in a nutshell. You just have to pay attention to the weight distribution of the piece of wood. If you see this tree right here, the, the tip is still is leaning on the, the ground right here. So I already know that because the, the tree is suspended like this, I know that I, I know where the tension and compression is. The compression's right here. If I try just cutting down, you know, straight into it, this tree's gonna close on my bar. And if I cut up, then it'll pop open. You still have to be careful even doing that because you don't want to release too much pressure too quickly. Um, but, but, but that's kind of the gist of it. And once I cut it, depending on if this piece goes on the ground or if it's suspended, you know, if this piece is suspended, let's say I cut this and this thing stands up, you know, I'll grab another stick here. You know, right now this tree's laying on the ground like this. Let's say I cut the tip off or let's say the butt was suspended and it's like this. Now the tension and compression is in the opposite side of the tree. Cause when I cut here, this wants to fall down. If I cut here, it wants to pinch my bar. So tension and compression, it's easily enough conceptualized. It's harder enough in practice, especially when you get tired, it's so easy to pinch your bar. So I'm gonna cut all the limbs off this thing right here and uh, <laughs> very few limbs and uh, then we'll, we'll buck it. So any of these limbs that are suspended like this, you know, if I cut here, I'm cutting into the tension side and the compression is collapsing. Any of the branches that are suspended are gonna be like that. And any ones that are under tension, they're, they're gonna be the opposite. So let's just limb this thing real quick. All right, so now I'm gonna cut it. I'm gonna cut down so that I, uh, you know, so I avoid all that compression, but I'm gonna just cut a little bit on the top so that it doesn't uh, peel, so it kind of breaks more cleanly. I, I don't, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> So that might have been too slight for you to notice, but actually as I was cutting, I felt this thing starting to pinch my bar and I pulled it out immediately. The tension, I was totally wrong. It looks like it's folded like that, but it's probably just barely touching the ground actually. And it's suspended over there because when I went to cut it, it started to just felt it just barely perceptible, started to close. So I pulled my saw out, which means I'm actually gonna cut up here. So just like I said, I was like, here's where the tension is, here's where the compression. I was dead wrong about this. So it's actually the opposite. I'm gonna cut the top of it. But you know, just paying attention to the saw, I was able to feel, I just felt a little bit of movement and I said, oh no, I was, it's opposite actually. Yeah, there you go. What do you know? And now the, the tension will be here and the compression will be here. See, see what happens when I cut the compression first. See, this piece doesn't weigh nothing because it's just a piece of firewood, but it's it's definitely like pinching on my saw right here. I could probably power through it because I got enough power, but I mean, it's, already, it's, it's, it's stiff, you know, because that's where all the compression is. See, it wants to, it wants to compress. And here's the tension. You know, it can get really confusing on hills when things are upright and stuff. Where's the tension? Where's the compression? But I mean, that's really the gist of it. It's one of those things that's it's quickly, you can kind of soak it in quickly, but it takes a lot of practice to really get the hang of it. So now we're gonna talk about pushing versus pulling the chain. Basically, the chain is always gonna be spinning clockwise. And when you're cutting on this side, this is what they call pulling the chain. And this is 
the main, this should be your go-to running the saw. And this up here, it's called pushing the chain. You can kind of know because the, the saw dust is going this way when you cut with this side, and when you cut with this side, it's shooting that way. But it's an important concept to know, you know, if somebody says, you know, pushing versus pulling the chain that you know what they're talking about. So this is pulling and this is pushing. The pro to pulling the chain is, well, the saw is designed that way. It's just everything is easier, especially when your saw is sharp. Um, really, most of the time you want to be a push uh, pulling the saw instead of pushing it there are some advantages to pushing the saw though it keeps you know it keeps all the sawdust away from you and it's actually easier let's say you're in a situation where you want to run it you can more quickly escape when you're pushing and then you stop and you get out of there sometimes it kind of grabs when you're pulling so it's less grabby but it takes more of a physical effort to push to, to yeah to push the chain so i'll pull one and then i'll push one <laughs> And that is, in a nutshell, pulling versus pushing the chain. Okay, so this is a very important part of the video. Hopefully, hopefully you're still here. Uh, we're gonna talk about kickback. Kickback, if you are gonna cut your head off, it's gonna be because of the, the kickback probably. You know, kickback is so dangerous running, uh, running a chainsaw because it happens so quickly and there's so much force behind it. It's just so, lethal and it's so important to not only know how to prevent it but know how it occurs and what it looks like so if i could tell you one thing in this video to be mindful of it is the tip of the chainsaw that's where things get really dangerous is around the tip of the chainsaw because let's say you're cutting something and you're not paying attention where your tip is you can hit something and this thing will just bounce back violently why don't i show you some kickback and then we'll talk about it actually <laughs> That is kickback, and you know, maybe it didn't look that violent, but I'm, I'm anticipating it. I'm holding tight, and the chamber is actually engaging really good, but I'm like anticipating it. When you are not expecting that, and you're really loose and relaxed, this thing, I, I swear, you might not believe it, this, I promise this can hit you in the face. It can go, it's so crazy, especially the, the bigger the saw is, the worse the kickback is. There's also a thing called chain sequencing, depending on how many cutters, like if you look at this chain, let's get a little closer into the chain. Okay, so this chain is called a full comp chain, meaning that there's a cutter, you know, there, there are lots of teeth. Some people, myself included, I'll, I'll typically run either, a, usually a skip tooth, which means this cutter would be missing. And basically the more teeth you have, the less the saw is gonna kick back. This is actually a pretty low kickback chain. It's got these goofy rakers too, so I'm assuming that helps with kickback as well. What happens, the reason the saw kicks back is you see the, the tooth right here. When you go to stab it into the wood, right dead on the nose, I mean, look, that can't go into the wood. It just, you have so much inertia built up, and when this touches the wood, boom, it just shoots the saw back. So it's physically impossible to cut straight in like that because the tooth just can't get in there. So it's just so important to be mindful of the tip. Now, sometimes you do need to plunge cut. You need to cut straight through and to avoid kickback, I'll show you how to do that. And all you have to do is you have to start the cut either in either you know in this corner right here or this corner because the tooth has to be able to grab into the wood so you saw it kick back i think this is a low kickback chain i was prepared for it it's full comp another thing is the shorter the bar the more harsh the kickback too because the longer bars are heavier so i promise you kickback can be way worse than what i just demonstrated so but i'll show you how to safely plunge cut so i just got to insert the bar here or here and then I can roll it. And once I'm in there and I'm pushing straight forward, then I'm cutting the wood with both corners of the bar. And then I can actually cut in like that.
And that's how you plunge cut. I did another intentional kick back there just to show you, you know, again, in case you forgot. But, uh, but yeah, that, that, that's how you plunge cut and that's how you avoid kick back. So important. And it's especially so important for climbers. We're up in the tree, 120 feet up in the air with these little tiny top handles. I mean, they kick back hard because the saws are so light and they've got a lot of power. So really important for climbing saws, especially to just always be mindful of where your tip is. All right, next thing we're gonna talk about is throwing the chain. You don't wanna throw the chain, that's the idea. The, the chain is when it comes off, throwing the chain is when it comes off the guide bar. And it happens for two reasons. One, your chain is too loose, like mine is right now. I just loosened it up a little bit because I'm, I'm gonna try to throw it. And the other is, if you're not cutting true, you're not really sticking it in there good, you know, you're doing weird angles and stuff. The chain wants to come out of the bar rails. It's, it's only in there so deep, you know, you, you've got to really be dead on, you know. Um, if you're like getting weird and you're bending it and stuff, the chain just wants to fly off. So let's see if I can get the chain to fly off. I've never done this on purpose. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> Well, there you go. I didn't have to do much. All I had to do was, th th see the reason that happened is because the saw was like this. If I would have revved it like this, it probably would have stayed on for a little while. But as soon as you go to do that, if the saw is loose, if the chain's loose, gravity just pulls it right off the guide bar. So, you know, that's just a little topic to cover. It's just important to keep good tension. If you tighten the, it too much, you can damage your guide bar. But if you don't tighten it up, you're gonna throw your chain and you could cut yourself, you could get hurt. So just try to keep your chain tight, you know, not super tight, just snug, and try to avoid cutting at weird angles, you know? Like, don't cut like this if you can avoid it, um, unless you're doing a face cut. If you're burying the bar, you don't need to worry about it, but the longer the bar gets and the less you have of it in the tree, the more likely it is that the chain's gonna come out. So measuring firewood, it can be kind of annoying if you've got a tape measure you're trying to get it you don't want them all over the place most fireplaces are 16 to 18 inches and uh, you know you can do it with a measuring stick you can cut a piece of wood and use that but i just want to show you this neat trick somebody showed me this years ago and i was just like oh it's so genius you, you you always have your arm with you right so somewhere in here you can probably find 16 inches I, i've measured my arms i know that between my knuckles right here to my elbow is 16 inches and i know from my pinky to my elbow is 18 inches so i always have a measuring stick so you know if i if I want to be really precise about the wood, I'll just do this. And I know that right here, because that's where my elbow is, I know that's exactly 16 inches. Uh, I don't have a tape measure with me, but you just have to believe me. This is exactly 16 inches. And even if your hand isn't perfectly 16 inches right there, you can grab it with this knuckle. You've got all these fingers, all, all these knuckles to work with. So you can probably find 16, 18 inches somewhere just with your arm. And then you've always got that. You can make a really nice you know, pile of firewood for yourself or for the, the homeowner, whoever you're cutting up for. That way you're not giving, especially as the, the pieces get bigger, people tend to cut them longer and longer, you know? You don't want to give the homeowner a bunch of 20 inch rounds when their, their fireplace is 18 inches. It's just, it's just, it's it's inconsiderate is where, you know, because then they've got these two inches they got to shave off. So I just think that's a great little trick. <laughs> I can't do it that way, it's so dumb. <laughs> Boom, perfect firewood. Okay, so this topic is so important and I know what you're thinking, well duh, that's obvious, but you can't cut the dirt. You, you gotta stay out of it. It is absolutely incredible what happens to your chain, even just cutting the littlest amount of dirt. So this piece is on the ground right here. The best way for us to cut through this without cutting the dirt is we're gonna cut about three quarters of the way through. We're gonna roll it over and then we're gonna do an undercut on the other side. If I see any dirt or rocks or anything, I wipe it off. I promise you, try as hard as you can not to cut the dirt. Even, I know what you're thinking, oh, what about just a little bit of dirt? Don't do it, <laughs> just trust me. So just cut them like this, it's easy.
it's so much easier to just cut it, roll it, and finish the cut. If you try cutting straight through, you're definitely gonna dull your saw. I did cut straight through on one of those, but it was kind of like on a branch. So, but if you just try, if you're just trying to cut straight through, it's it's not gonna happen. Okay, I just want to show you how I'll just cut the dirt a little bit and look at the difference here. So I haven't cut the dirt yet. Watch. So <laughs> more than twice as long and uh, I'm kind of an idiot for doing it that way. I, I was pushing down on the saw. Uh, I was like trying to, I don't know why. I, you shouldn't push down on the saw. You should let it do its own work. I was pushing, look, look when I don't push the saw. Look how bad it cuts. I mean, that was bad enough, but I mean, watch this. It doesn't cut. I, I I don't know why I was like I was like trying to cut it as fast as I could. I was trying to cut it as fast as I could. It was still 12 seconds, but really it's not cutting at all because it's not self-feeding. So now so the saw's dull. You saw that. I I barely hit the dirt. This isn't even gravel or anything. We're like in the woods. This is this is fluffy dirt right here, and uh, and it's wet outside. I mean, shoot, that it's not like I cut gravel or concrete, and the the saw's inoperable. So. We, uh, I'll show you just real quickly how to sharpen this thing up so you can get right back at it. Okay, so now that the saw is dull, we've gotta get it sharp, we gotta get it cutting again. This isn't like a fully comprehensive video about sharpening. This is, you know, there are better ways to do it. Personally, I, I usually square grind. I, I round file my smaller saws, but I, I use a square grinder for my big saws that's kind of nerdy and you know there's a big learning curve this is going to just be you know a basic guide to you know how to get your saw cutting really quite well it should cut better than a, a brand new chain if you do these steps and you don't have to go down any big rabbit holes trying to get your technique or grinder set up or anything like that so we're just going to do a very basic chain sharpening tutorial that anybody if you follow these steps anybody can do this you can get your saw working really well so I'll show you the tools we've got a 7 30 seconds round file and an organ file handle. We've got a flat file and an organ handle. And then for the, the rakers, I, I'm going to show you this. This is an organ uh, depth gauge guide. I call them rakers, some people call them depth gauges. Yeah, personally, I, I use this West Coast saw one for my saw. Um, it has four different settings on it, but it's a little harder to use, so I'm going to use the I'm gonna use a simple one for this video. And then I'll show you this. This is a really handy, this is just a little guide right here, which can really be helpful, especially when you're starting to learn. This is an organ guide for the 732nd file. I saw all that stuff at sappysupplies.com. And so we'll just get into it. I'll probably zoom in on the chain a little bit here. Okay, so here we are. This tooth is all knackered up. I mean, look at that. Look, look at this tooth right here. This is just absolutely knackered isn't that amazing how quickly that happened i mean i only touched the dirt for like a second <laughs> and it's just all knackered so we've got the round file the round file fits in fits in here the first sharpens always a little bit clunky like the file doesn't fit in there that well so i'll actually put it in more like at this angle at first and then i'll switch to the, the proper angle i'm just trying to kind of create a spot for my file to get in there so i'm actually going like 90 degrees against the tooth Right now, I'm just trying to create a little room for my file to fit in there. It's always the hardest on the first sharpen. So now that I'm in there, I'm kind of coming under the tooth. And we're just going to swipe away until this tooth is sharp. Okay, so there you have it. There's the basic shape. It's just, you know, there's really not much to it. You just you just carve it out. The only thing is, you know, you got to keep in mind that the, the, the file, because it's round, if you hold it too far down, you can actually not be hitting this top plate. And if you hold it too high up, you can actually flatten this top plate. 
So, you know, you got to be careful. Um, you do want to get the whole thing. You want it to look kind of like a crescent shape, like a crescent moon. So basically, if you use this guide right here, and some people, they want to give the guides a hard time. I like the guides. I think that they work pretty good because what, what it does is it takes, it allows you to, instead of like needing a bunch of skill and practice at sharpening, it just saves you a bunch of time. It gets the hard part taken care of because what happens is the, the tooth sits on the, to, uh, the the top of the tooth rests on the bottom of this guide right here, which places the file at the at a very nice height, and it also gives you the angle that you want to go for right here. So, another thing that you can do is you can use one of these guides, and this it's kind of hard because once again it's the first sharpen of this chain, so I gotta make some room in here. But another thing you can do is you can. You know, you can scoop out a bunch of metal because you can sharpen faster without the guide. You can get more of the tooth. You can get the bottom of the tooth. So you might, you know, get the tooth like 90% of the way. And you can see there is a... This is so hard to film by yourself, man. Okay. <laughs> you can see there's a line right there that's going to run parallel to the bar. And that's going to give you your angle. You know, obviously the, the guide isn't necessary, but it just makes it a heck of a lot easier to make sure that you are setting the file down in the correct spot because the, the file is round. It has to sit sort of like, I don't know, two thirds or three quarters of the way up on the tooth so that you're getting underneath it. And you see there how we've got like a nice crescent shape. It looks like a C. If, you, if, you're, if you're too high with the file, this part is going to be flat. And if you're too low, it's going to have a, they call it a slope if you're too high. And it's going to have like a big beak if you're too low. So you basically want it to look like that. So that tooth is good. So, you know, guide or no guide, it doesn't really matter. But that's the basic shape that you're going for. You definitely want to get all this metal down here, you, you know. Um, so you want it to look like. Basically, the top of the tooth should be at the same spot as this. That, that's the basic shape that you're going for. And you're going to do that with every tooth. You can leave the guide on. You can take the guide off. You can use the guide just for the very top at the very end. Um, but now that the tooth is sharpened, we've got to take care of this raker right here. So the raker regulates how much wood the cutter actually grabs. So the lower this is, the more wood this tooth is going to hit. And you gotta remember, we only wanna cut, we're basically making a little, it's like a chisel, like a planer. We're just trying to use this top right here to actually peel off strips of wood. If you take this all the way off, you might think, oh, it'll cut really fast because this whole tooth is gonna cut, but it, it's just gonna jam up in the wood. It's not going to actually cut. So the higher this is, and every time you sharpen it, see the slopes down. So as you sharpen it, this raker needs to be adjusted. You need to file this down because Eventually, this is going to be higher than the teeth, which it's about even now. And so you're just going to see powder. It's just going to be powder. You're going to be like, what the heck is going on? So we've got to lower this. Well, how low do you go? Well, let's not eyeball. Let's just use the guide. Let's just measure it. These are really funky rakers. I don't know why they look like that. Usually, they're more like straight, like this is all cattywampus. I don't know what the deal is with these. So we need to adjust this. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, so here's our Oregon guide, and this is set to uh, this is set to 0.25 of an inch. Honestly, I don't really fully understand those numbers, <laughs> but uh, so this is 0.25. So the more aggressive you go, 0.25, that's a pretty conservative number. The more aggressive you go, the bigger bites you're gonna take. So 0.50 would be like really aggressive. 0.25, that's good. You you don't need to go any more than that for most people. If you're in really soft wood you know, like a fur and stuff like that, you can go more than this, but only when you're bucking wood. As soon as when you start to go at diagonal, um, like if you're in a hardwood, you're gonna get want want the, the chain's gonna bind up, it won't be able to pull through. So 0.25 is just a good overall a depth to go for. I would just stick with this, unless you, like I said, if you're in really soft wood, then you can be more aggressive, but for the most part, you know, if you're out on the East Coast or something, you're going to want to keep it there. And so you just put it right on there. And now this is resting on the teeth, but it's got a little bit of a recess in here so that the raker pops up just a little bit. It protrudes past this opening 
right here. And uh, you just stick it on there and you just file across. And you can see how the metal is getting shiny right there. So shiny means I just filed it. So, you know, and th that's another thing when you sharpen your tooth, you wanna look, you wanna actually get underneath the tooth and look at it. If the whole thing is shiny, then you know that you sharpened it all. So we just took a little bit off the raker right here. And now it's a, it's a little bit lower. It's almost imperceivable, but you just want it a little bit lower. And honestly, I could probably take a couple extra swipes off this if I wanted. You know, I live in the Pacific Northwest. Our wood's pretty soft, but, you know, that's basically... And if I stick my guide back on there, you can see it's, it's right there. And so that's what I'll do with every tooth. So I'll actually, you know, I'll sharpen each tooth and then I'll measure each raker. Measure the rakers, just do it. It's easy and it, uh, what it does is it makes sure that each tooth is grabbing the same amount of wood. Let's, you know, some people say count your strokes, sharpen all your teeth the same. That's because the theory is you want the teeth to be all grabbing the same amount of wood. If one side is grabbing more wood than others, you know, you're gonna have, it's gonna feel like your bar is bent. You're gonna be cutting bowls and stuff. But if you measure your rakers, if the, this, rakers measured you know you could sharpen these all the way down to nubs and this one could be long it doesn't matter you just don't you don't need to count your strokes or anything just focus on each individual tooth get the cutter sharp get the raker measured and the saw will perform well it doesn't matter if they're all the same length or not as long as you measure the rakers so i'll go through and i'll sharpen each tooth and then i'll go through and i'll do each raker and you know, honestly it's hard for me to do this it's hard for me to rush through this because i could talk about chainsaw chain for hours uh, but that's just the basic gist of how to get your saw sharp. Okay, and I'll show you, I'll just show you how I do this. If I've got, so this tooth, you can see like this whole corn right here is folded in. I got to take quite a bit of metal off this. And actually, if I have a really knackered chain and I have to take a lot of metal off, sometimes what I'll do is this. <laughs> I'll actually use two files. They're both 730 seconds. But the thing is, you can sharpen so much faster and easier without the guide. But I do like how the guide gets the top plate the angle and the depth perfect. So if I have like a lot of metal to take off, see, I'll, I'll start in like this. I'm just trying to carve a spot because it's the first time I've sharpened this chain. You know, I'm just trying to carve a spot and now I go back to my angle. And what I'll do is I'll just sharpen it without the guide because it's so much faster. See, I gotta take a lot of metal off this tooth. So the tooth's 90% there and then I'll just take the guide just so I can get the top plate and everything just totally perfect. I'll just use the guide for just a few swipes. And that's a really sharp tooth. And I took a lot of metal off really fast. And, you know, you don't need the guide, but it, I just like the consistency. Um, so if I have a lot of metal to take off, sometimes I will rock two files and just do the guide at the very end just to really get the, get the tooth 95% of the way there and just really true it up with that guide at the very end there if I'm trying to sharpen really quickly. Okay, back at this log here. All right, we sharpen the chain. Let's see how it does now. There you go. It's not the fastest cutting saw in the world, but it's cutting smoothly. It was very little effort on my part. You know, it's a pretty small saw. Um, so like I said, it's not, it's not the fastest cutting machine, but the chain is cutting well because it's nice and smooth, very little effort on my part to cut with this. So this thing's, uh, this thing's sharp. If you remember before the top of my chain was all dark looking, that's like burnt pitch and stuff on it. If the chain's sharp, the, the chain should be, you know, pretty shiny. So it actually looks cleaner now than before I was running it. All right, well, we're done cutting. So not everybody is as uh, particular about this as I am, but I like to keep my saws very clean just because I've noticed over the years I've had many saws. And I don't know, the ones that are clean are the ones that last a long time. A lot of times when you're cleaning it, you find all sorts of you know nuts and bolts missing. You, you fix it right then and there. The saw also can build up a lot of heat if you don't clean it up because it just gets so packed full of gunk. The saw is very clean. We've only cut, you know, one tree with it, but I'll show you anyway. So, you know, first thing we want to do is uh, we want to take the side cover off. Use this just fast. 
faster than a bar wrench. Okay, so we've got a little bit of gunk in here. And all I do to clean this really is I use an air compressor. Usually I do this outside, but I'm just gonna do that just in here. <laughs> See if I can show you all the gunk blown out of it. Oh yeah, gunk all over my garage. Okay, and you wanna clean the bar too. These um these little these little West Coast saw deals, they're actually really good at getting the gunk out of the bar which there's like nothing in this. I like, I only cut one tree with it, but the, if you, when you clean out the gunk in the bar, that's actually, look at that. I am getting some out of it. This gunk also builds up. This all builds heat and resistance. So getting this crap out of here helps a lot. But the, in my opinion, the most important part of the bar to clean are these little oil ports right here. So right here, this is the part you really want to make sure that you clean. This is the oil port right here. This is where the, the oil comes out and it goes into, you know, these little holes on your guide bar line up with it right there. And that's what oils your saw. You want to make sure that's clean. And sometimes if your saw is super gunky, like I'll cover this up with my thumb so I'm not blowing stuff in there. But other times, like I'll actually blow, like I'll try to blow at this angle. So it goes from this direction that way from that way that way i'm not blowing gunk into the oil oil hole so i'll kind of do that to make sure it's clean. okay excuse the awkward camera angle here but now that i blew it out i'll actually cover this with my thumb so i'm not blowing crap into the oil Okay, so all that gunk is clean. A lot of times I'll blow, I'll blow all around just to try to get all the gunk off of there. A little more. And if the saw is really dirty, really grimy, I'll actually use gas. I'll pour gas on it and scrub it, and it, it takes the, it takes all that gunk off uh, actually pretty well. Now, the, the most important part, of, you know, to clean the saw is the air filter, and it's usually under this cover. This saw's kind of weird. Usually they have like easy click deals. This one you actually have to unscrew. So that comes off. Kind of a weird, there's a clip right here. They're all a little bit different. Okay, so the air filter comes off. And you know, there's there's like nothing in it, but that will build up and obviously the more dust you have in there the, the more likely it is that something's gonna get through you're, you're gonna suffocate your saw it won't be able to breathe if you don't clean that regularly um i'll show you this too that's also important on the on these saws that you you see the the throttle right there you know you see it opening and closing right there a lot of times you you want to choke the saw so that the so that that valve is closed so that way when you're when you remove the air filter, you don't have gunk falling down in there. So but kind of a weird air filter, but it, it's still very clean. I only cut one tree with it, but it's important to keep up on that. That's the most important part of the saw to clean probably. All right, let's put this thing back together. I'm giving the saw away, so I need to ship it. So I'm not gonna be putting the bar and chain back on, but we'll put the covers back on. And I don't know why this is the case, but I've just noticed with some saws, you gotta clean the air filters way more than others. They don't all get dirty at the same rate. I don't know what the deal with that is, but that is what I've noticed. But yeah, a clean saw is a happy saw. Just everything's gonna operate so much better, so much more smoothly, if you just try to clean the gunk out somewhat regularly, you know, so things aren't binding up and getting hot and not working well. I'm telling you, when you see a clean saw, even if it's an old saw, it's gonna run better than some old grimy thing, usually. All right, so the saw is clean. Okay, so the saw is clean. So now let's say we want to store it for the winter or for any sort of long duration. Your saw is going to perform a lot better if you just do this step. Okay, so before we store it, we want to get the gas out of this thing. 
So I'm gonna open this other gas container. The gas is gonna is what really fouls up your saw when it stores for a long time. I mean, I so and and we we've got ethanol free gas in here, which is gonna help a lot. But still, we just want to get it out of the saw because it's just gonna be less likely to you know separate and gunk up. And gas has an expiration date, so. I'm shipping this saw off because I'm giving it away, but you know, if I'm storing it, I would do the same thing. So I'm just gonna try to pour this back into this can here. And don't worry about the bar oil. I have to empty my bar oil because you can't ship a saw with fluids in it. But if you're storing it, the bar oil is not gonna go bad. You don't need to dump that out. But you, you wanna you wanna dump the gas out of it. The battery saws are so great, they can just sit forever and you don't need to worry about, you know, the gas or any of that stuff fouling up. You don't gotta worry about the carburetor, you don't gotta worry about not blowing gunk in there when you're cleaning it out. So I'm a huge fan of the battery saws. They they don't quite do the trick or they just don't have the same power as the gas ones do, but they've come a long ways and they probably will eventually someday. They're getting really good and they are a whole lot easier to maintain than the gas ones. Okay, so we dumped the gas out and it's out of the tank, but it's actually not out of the saw. It's still in the carburetor. What we're gonna do is we're actually gonna run this saw and we're gonna let it idle to death. And that'll make sure that all of this, the gas is completely, it's completely out of the saw. I think it took two and a half minutes. <laughs> that thing was stubborn. Did not want to die. Okay, so this saw is empty. It's ready to be stored. I'm going to be shipping it off. I, I'm not sure how I'm going to uh, do the giveaway yet, but I'll put it in the description of this video. By the way, if you see any comments in the comments, like, hey, you won. Some, some people, sometimes they, they steal my profile picture. They slightly change my name. They say, hey, message me on Telegram. You want an iPhone or something like that. Those are scams. I've been getting bombarded with those lately. But uh, I will be giving this away, but I'll... Like I said, I'll put it in the description how I'm gonna do that and how I'm gonna announce the winner. Um, I'm not sure how I'm gonna do that yet, but so the saw is ready to go. I hope you liked that video. Let me know, did I miss anything in this video? It was very, it's kind of difficult to get everything into to one video, but that's the gist of it. That's how, that's how you own and operate and maintain and uh, store a chainsaw, a gas powered chainsaw. So, you know, if you watch that video all the way through, you're not gonna be, you know, this, this video is not gonna make you any sort of uh, expert, but it, it gives you the gist of it. You basically, if you can, you know, retain the information from this video, you, you basically know how to run a chainsaw. And uh, it's just that simple. I, I appreciate you guys watching. Please check out my store, sappysupplies.com. And please like and subscribe. Um, I recently hit a million subscribers, so thank you for that. And yeah, hopefully that video, you found that educational and entertaining. Maybe you could share it to somebody who's buying their first chainsaw or something like that. And, uh, well, with that being said, th thanks again, guys. I'll see you later.